we're going to talk about how to create capital and get ready, become your own bank. We speak with Ben Summer, founder and managing director of Adagio Group, to become our own bank. It seems to be, first of all, a no-brainer that we need to think and operate like a financial institution, yet we can be our own bank. Can you kind of unravel that for us? So a shadow bank is any financial institution that is non-depository. The fundamental question that governs, governs all of investing, which is, what is the risk? What is the return? And then what are the liquidity characteristics? How long do I have to hold this thing before I can sell it to the market? Here's an insider's brief about protecting your portfolio from market crises while generating above market returns. We're going to talk about how to create capital and get ready, become your own bank. We speak with Ben Summer, founder and managing director of Adagio Group, who has a new book out that's called The Shadow Banker's Secrets. I want to know all about that. Hi, Ben. Welcome to the Tony D'Urso Show. Appreciate that. Good to be here. Ben, this is uh, really caught my eye when I when I saw that you uh, would like to do an interview. It was like, be our own bank. So let me just straight up. This is this was the first thing on my interest list to be now to become our own bank. It seems to be first of all a no brainer that we need to think and operate like a financial institution. Yet we can be our own bank. Can you kind of unravel that for us? Sure. So I loosely define banking as the function of creating capital, right? And without going off on a tangent, I think most people are probably aware of how the Federal Reserve works and fractional reserve banking at this point. Now, 10 years ago, it was a novel idea, but I think most people are aware of that. Um, so what we're focusing on here is how to do that outside of the regulatory constraints that are imposed upon traditional depository institutions. In other words, commercial banks, right? And so what may not be obvious is this, every other financial institution that's non-depository creates capital. It's very similar, if not perfectly analogously to commercial banks. Um, there's just an additional step of monetizing that capital uh, that can also be addressed. But in effect, you're ultimately creating money out of thin air in a perfectly analogous manner to how commercial banks do so. All right, I'm getting that in my brain and I'm thinking here we're going to get in in the we're going to get into the world of investing. Not all of us in the audience here are into doing high level investments. I've I've been there, done that and I have my own my own history on that. But one thing is there's a lot of variables that determine the quality and uh, of it and so forth and I'd like to get your take on that. Yeah, that's actually a really good segue uh, from where we started, right? So I talked about creating capital, but then there's, if you're a shadow bank, which I should define first, right? So a shadow bank is any financial institution that is non-depository. So Wells Fargo, Bank of America, where you go and open a checking account, those are depository institutions, those are commercial banks. Investment banks like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, those are believe it or not, fall into the category of shadow bank. Shadow bank has kind of a, an ominous feel and connotation, um, but it, it really is just a, a catch-all term to describe, like I said, every financial firm that's non-depository, and they create capital. Now, when you create capital as a non-depository bank, you have to monetize it, right? And so, first of all, I guess the question to ask would be, what, what is this capital we're talking about? And these are shares in a fund. So if anybody's ever run a fund or participated in a fund or is aware of the fund world, right? When you raise money within a fund, you're selling ownership interests in that fund. Think of them like shares, stocks, right? Well, when you're doing that, you're converting that capital that you created, the share in the company, and you're trading it for dollars. That's monetizing the share. That's monetizing the, the, the uh, financial instrument, the financial capital. So the question becomes, all right, well, what gives that value, right? So ultimately, it's just a contract. You drop a piece of paper, and then you sell shares via this piece of paper. There's nothing really concrete that's changing hands. And the answer to that question is the fundamental question that governs, governs all of investing, which is, 
what is the risk? What is the return? And then what are the liquidity characteristics? How long do I have to hold this thing before I can sell it to the market? And this becomes particularly germane to the entrepreneurial crowd who may not be interested and probably should not be interested in investing in things outside of their own business. If you are running a good business and you're serious about it, you should definitely believe in it. And if you do, all of your time, energy, and resources should go into that. That being said, the, this idea becomes very germane in the sense of, say you're running one business in one sector or one industry, and you want to grow. How do you do that? Well, one way of doing it is the way private equity firms do it. And private equity is one brand of shadow banking where they will create this idea. We have a strategy. We're going to go buy construction companies. And they'll say, all right, they'll draw these documents up. And I'm going to say, all right, we're going to go buy construction companies and you're going to give us money to go do it, all right? So we're just going to say, give us money. Here's this piece of paper in exchange, hundreds of millions of dollars. And we'll go buy construction companies. Well, if you want to grow within your sector and annex other firms by effectively your competition, you can do the same thing. You can create a fund and then take the money that you raise in that fund and then go buy and scale that way through accreting other businesses. But again, this goes back to the question I haven't yet answered, which is, well, how do you do that? What, what gives that paper value? Because it really, really only is paper. And the answer to that is, what is the probability of loss weighted by the expected degree of that loss on the money that I put into this fund, the money that I used to buy this financial instrument, the money that was used to monetize that financial asset. And this is a mathematically driven endeavor, but that is all, just like, but, but it's, and it's, the math is kind of complex, but it's what drives the entire gambling industry, right? So the entire gambling industry is predicated on the idea of understanding these probabilities. Like little old ladies know that you go to the slot machine and know what the probabilities are. You go play blackjack, people know. You go to the roulette wheel, people know. The same, the math is more complex in financial markets, but it exists. It's new. It was only developed as recently as 2014. But the point is, you can measure the risk, the return, and the liquidity of the strategy of an asset manager. And there are a lot of variable, variables that have to be taken into account. But when you do this, it's the measured risk and return that give that piece of paper value. And the reason I elaborated on that is because I think this is probably an area where, uh, again, entrepreneurs and business owners and maybe executives want to go out on their own can leverage this expertise to go out, raise money and take their one business and use a fund potentially to buy many more to grow in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. That makes very good sense. So the, the lowest common denominator here, in other words, the takeaway for, for the audience, entrepreneurs, business people, is we can raise funds and invest to invest in our business as well as buy other businesses in our in our category or whatever we determine. Perhaps I didn't quite get it, but you could fill in the blanks a little bit more on that. I, I, I think you nailed it. I think you probably get it better better than you're giving yourself credit for. So, um, when I say creating becoming your own bank, creating capital out of thin air, um, just, just really briefly, the process is you, you create these things called offering documents, right? They're, whatever they're, I'm, I won't go into the details. You create these documents, right? And these documents are the legalese that are the concrete representation, as concrete as it gets of this abstract idea of, I'm gonna go buy other businesses, give me money for it, right? Um, and so you put, and it's a business entity, either a limited partnership or an LLC, and these docs govern how this limited partnership or LLC run, like any other business. You go out and you sell interest in this business entity, just like you might sell interest in your own firm. But the difference is you're not diluting yourself. You're diluting an external entity that you manage. Right. So you're, you, you don't have you're not subject to the traditional J curve of the, you know, the MBA, um, you know, private equity play. You, you're controlling your own capital. And that's that's what I mean by becoming your own bank. You're literally creating your own money. You just drop a piece of paper. You create a new entity. You say that this idea needs five hundred million dollars. Arbitrary. Five hundred million dollars. Now you just go create a bunch of contracts that you trade for literally five hundred million dollars and your ability to get that five hundred million dollars in exchange for just the paper representing the idea and the business entity is the measured risk return and liquidity. And then you just take that money and you can do whatever you're allowed to within the confines of that, those documents, which 
to, again, with your audience, should be probably to buy businesses in their own industry and or sector. Amazing. That, and, you don't kind of need a, and you don't need a Series 7 license to, to do this. That's correct. So Series 7 is a brokerage license. Um, ultimately, if you, you're managing over $150 million, that's not real estate, you may potentially need a Series 65. But you're exempt up to $150 million, do not require licensing. Um, there's some other minor regulatory considerations, but it, it's really uh, sort of the Wild West in terms of the ability to, again, form capital. I love it. Let's, let's set this up and raise money for my podcast. I'll buy other podcasts and I'll go up to $150 million. I'm in. Let's do it. This is absolutely amazing. So now I've I've done fundraising before in a sort uh, without having a license by just directing people to what I considered was a good investment and talking about what I got out of it. And, and uh, it was all legal and proper and uh, people would, you know, move along. And so so I, I've learned some of this stuff is what I'm trying to say, but sure. there's pitfalls, you know, usually in, in investing or, or raising capital, you go to friends, you go to family, you go to people, you know, but you know, when I did it, I didn't know anybody that had a lot of money, you know, it's, it's work. So really yeah. quick, just another minute here. How do we, how, how can we scale on something like this? That's a really good question. Glad you asked it. It's be tough to answer in a minute, but I'll do my best. Right. So actually that's actually what our business is, is investment bank. On, our, on the buy side, we actually recruit asset managers who can generate exceedingly good performance that have tapped out friends and family. They might manage $90 million, $200 million, $5 million, and they engage us to raise a billion dollars plus. And it's shocking. And it goes back to this definition of risk that I won't re, re, restate. But if you ask a thousand financial professionals, what is risk? They've got no idea, right? It's a, it's a very esoteric expertise that's really gated behind the most sophisticated financial firms, right? Think of like Blue Owl, you know, the, the inner workings of Blackstone, for example, right? And so the way to determine investment quality is to measure the probability of loss weighted by the potential degree of that loss in exactly the same way you do intuitively when you play blackjack or roulette, right? Now, deep conversation for another time, but that is the only consideration that matters. Now, when you can do that and you can use those numbers to design and engineer financial products, where financial engineering comes in, much more complicated, right? Now you can engage the institutional space as a peer, command their respect, and start raising money at scale. So there, I'd say there is a pretty substantial chasm expertise that's required to jump from friends and family to institutional money, um, but it's not impossible as most people think. It just requires a very high level of quantitative expertise. Amazing. Well, listeners, you got to get the book, The Shadow Banker's Secrets. It's on, it's on Amazon, and I'm going to have a link to the book in the show notes. And to find out more about Ben and what they do, here's, a, here's an easy link, and it's a little unusual, so pay attention. It's adagio.capital. That's A-D-A-G-I-O dot capital. It's not a dot com. Just type that in and it will take you to, to Ben's site, Adagio Capital, and tell you all about it. Ben, I want to do another interview. There's more to learn about this. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and telling us about this. Thank you, Tony. It's been a pleasure.